Hello, divers. Coming to you from Studio D, this is the Deep Dive Microcast, a brief look into things I find interesting, and I hope you do too. I'm Tom Feeney, raconteur, unindicted co-conspirator, and writer for Wang's Chop Movie Magazine. In this edition of the Deep Dive Microcast, we look at a television show from the 1980s that took the name of a popular horror franchise and absolutely nothing else. Friday the 13th, the series. What you say? You weren't aware there was a TV series based on the seemingly endless series of horror movies where hapless campers are hacked to death by an unkillable hockey enthusiast? Well, there was. And there wasn't. But we'll get to all that. The first Friday the 13th film came out way back in 1980. It was an independent film meant to capitalize on the incredible success of John Carpenter's Halloween, released just two years prior. Made on a budget of only around half a million dollars, producer and director Sean S. Cunningham created a film that seemed to be greater than the sum of its severed parts. For the young counselors at Camp Crystal Lake, Friday the 13th was a very unlucky day. A 24-hour nightmare of horror that could only end in death. Friday the 13th, rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. Because Friday the 13th turned out better than expected, a bidding war ensued between several movie studios looking for the distribution rights. Ultimately, Paramount Pictures won the rights to release Friday the 13th in the United States, beating out Warner Brothers and United Artists. Now, critics tended to dismiss it as another slasher ripoff, but audiences went nuts. During its original run in theaters, the first Friday grossed nearly $60 million, and that's around $215 million in 2022 dollars. So, of course, Paramount decided that one success was enough and never pursued sequels just to make more money, right? Yeah. Truth is, the higher-ups at the studio wasted no time churning out a sequel, and less than a year later, Friday the 13th Part 2 hacked its way into theaters. Friday the 13th Part 2. The body count continues. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. The day you count on for terror is not over. 23... Friday, the 13th, Part 2, from Paramount Pictures, rated R, under 17, not admitted without parent. Interestingly, according to the terrific book Crystal Lake Memories, one of the original ideas was to make a series of unrelated anthology films that took place on Friday the 13th. Well, you can imagine how well that went over with the executives at Paramount. In hindsight, those execs may have been correct, That same idea was tried in 1982 with Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, and audiences were not buying into it. But that's another show. So the Friday franchise began to chug along. There was the Part 3 in 3D, followed by the final chapter, which wasn't, and a new beginning, which sounds like a Hallmark movie. This takes us up to 1987. Paramount was seriously considering hanging up Jason's hockey mask for good because each sequel was making less money than the one before. The franchise was languishing in limbo. Meanwhile, the head of Paramount Television contacted producer Frank Mancuso Jr. Mancuso had been in charge of the Friday movie since the first sequel, but was ready to move on to other projects. The folks at Paramount had other ideas. They wanted a Friday the 13th television series to run in syndication. 
That means the show would be sold directly to TV stations around the country, not part of a particular network or cable outlet. Mancuso wasn't really interested. After all, how do you take a gory, R-rated slasher movie with a protagonist that doesn't speak and make it into a weekly TV series? Mancuso needed some advice on what to do. He went to the one person who would understand his dilemma, his father, Frank Mancuso Sr., who just happened to be the chairman and CEO of Paramount. The elder Mancuso told his son to make whatever kind of show he wanted. As long as it has the Friday the 13th title, it'll sell. Of course, it's never as simple as that. Mancuso Jr. wanted to make an anthology series with different stories each week. Paramount wanted a show that had a consistent theme and recurring characters, an audience can look forward to seeing every episode. After a great deal of brainstorming, Mancuso came up with a concept that satisfied both requirements. There's a new series coming to television. If you don't watch it, you could be making a grave error. A very grave error. Friday the 13th, the series... So the setting is an antique shop, once owned by Louis Vendredi, which is French for Friday, by the way. He makes a deal with the devil, which is always a solid business decision. And in exchange for immortality and other demonic powers, agrees to sell cursed antiques from the store. In the pilot episode, Vendredi decides he doesn't want to do the devil's work anymore and stops selling the antiques to unwitting innocents. Naturally, the guy with the pitchfork doesn't react too well to this and claims Vendredi's soul killing him. The antique store ends up in the hands of Vendredi's niece, Mickey, played by the mono-named actress-slash-singer Roby, and her cousin Ryan, played by actor John LeMay. Now, they've never met before, and neither have ever met their Uncle Louis. The two have no interest in keeping the store, so they begin selling off the merchandise not realizing that the antiques still carry a curse. Enter our third lead, occult expert and antique supplier Jack Marshak. Marshak and Vondredi were childhood friends, and he introduced Vondredi to the world of the paranormal. Together, Mickey, Ryan, and Jack discovered that those cursed antiques were not only giving their new owners supernatural abilities but also causing numerous deaths. The rest of the series follows the trio, attempting to track down and retrieve those antiques so they won't cause any more harm. If you've ever seen the recent sci-fi series Warehouse 13, you get the general idea. Each episode featured a different antique and a different owner. The curse of each antique was specific to that object. For example... A scalpel once used by Jack the Ripper can perform any surgery, but must be used to kill an innocent person first. There's a cursed tobacco pipe that burns whoever smokes it, or a pool cue stick that makes a player unbeatable as long as they beat someone to death before using it. Fun stuff like that. Friday the 13th, the series, was pretty violent for its time. The producers had a lot of leeway to be more graphic because the show was syndicated and not tied to a network, so TV stations could run it later in the evening if they wished. There are people who think that Halloween is a kid's game. It isn't. The one thing that'll spoil a party is a visit by a ghost. I command you to be gone! And when that ghost is your dearly departed Uncle Lewis, I've come back to undo the curse. You will find yourself facing deadly traps (laughs) and twisted little demons. I've been waiting for you, Jack. Yes, it's a haunted Halloween on Friday the 13th, the series. Tonight at 11 on WXXA. The show began airing the first week of October 1987 and almost immediately became the second highest rated syndicated series in the highly coveted males from 18 to 49 demographic. 
What was the highest rated? Well, it made its debut the week before. Some little-known show called Star Trek The Next Generation. The success of Friday the 13th, the series, even drew the interest of one of the greatest horror directors of all time. David Cronenberg, who's helmed such classics as The Fly, The Dead Zone, and this year's Crimes of the Future, directed one of the series' best episodes, Faith Healer. It was about a cursed glove that could heal the terminally ill, but unless the wearer transfers the sickness to another person, they themselves will fall victim to it. Promise to cure me, and I'm dying! With the evil powers of a miracle glove, he holds the key to life and death. First the glove heals, and then the glove kills to pay for it. It's a chilling nightmare that begins with a single touch on Friday the 13th, the series. Next week, you'll pray it doesn't happen to you. It's a great episode and has some really creepy and grisly moments. The fact that the people behind Friday the 13th, the series, were able to create a truly moody and scary show every week on a fairly minuscule budget is a testament to their hard work and creativity. Sadly, Friday the 13th, the series, met with an untimely demise. But why? Was the show itself cursed? Did strange happenings occur on the set? Were paranormal experts brought in to investigate? No, none of that's true. Sounds good, though. As it happens, Friday the 13th, the series, met its end in the usual fashion. Cancellation. Lead actor John LeMay, who played Ryan, left the show after season three's opening two-part episode, The Prophecies. In the story, Ryan was possessed by a demon and somehow was physically regressed into his 10-year-old self. Now, I've heard of departing actors being killed off, but never aged off. Well, this kind of signaled the beginning of the end for the series. A new actor was hired to replace the Ryan character, but the chemistry simply wasn't there between the new guy and the other leads. Ultimately, a boycott of the show's sponsors, led by a fundamentalist Christian organization, resulted in the show's abrupt cancellation only 20 episodes into a 26-episode season. And unfortunately, Friday the 13th, the series, never got a proper series finale. There was some speculation, unconfirmed however, that the series finale would have had Jason's iconic hockey mask be the final cursed item to be located. We'll never know for sure. The movies, however, simply will not die, much like Jason Voorhees himself. In fact, three years after the series cancellation, actor John LeMay starred in Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday, as a totally different character. Now, speaking of Final Fridays, remember when I said the folks at Paramount wanted a Friday the 13th series based on Jason, but it would be too violent and too difficult to build a show around an emotionless, silent killing machine? Well, times change. The creator of the original Friday film, Sean S. Cunningham, has been working on just that called The Crystal Lake Chronicles. It would be kind of a Riverdale-like teen drama set in the town of Crystal Lake. The town has become something of a tourist attraction because of Jason Voorhees and his hackings and slashings. And yes, apparently the CW has expressed interest. Now, it's fairly tricky to find the series on streaming sites. Its last known purveyor was Amazon Prime Video, but it's no longer on that platform. Episodes are currently available on YouTube in eh, varying quality, if you are interested. In the final analysis, though, Friday the 13th, the series, was a good, solid, spooky show with a meaningless title that deserved better than it got. Thanks for listening. If this is the first time you've heard this podcast, check out our past episodes and subscribe so you don't miss a single one. 
And we want to hear from you. Drop us a line at the deep dive podcast gmail.com or on our Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter feeds. You can find links to all of those and our merchandise store in the bio of our Instagram page. From all of us here at Studio D, which again is just me and my cat, stay safe and take care. All clips used in the Deep Dive microcast are meant for educational purposes only and not to infringe on existing copyrights. The Deep Dive Lounge theme was arranged and performed by Robert Acorn based on the original composition by Ryan Blaney. The Deep Dive Microcast is a production of Automaton Studios.